Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get going. Um, so I'm Steve Higgins, director of the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health, and I wanna welcome everybody to um, our November uh, lecture in the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health lecture seri series. So we're really um, uh, in great shape today. We have Gail D'Onofrio, as you see in, in the slide here, um, joining us from Yale University to speak on emergency department initiated buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. So Gail is a pioneer in, in this area of research and certainly one of our nation's experts. And so really I'm, I'm thrilled to, to have her uh, with us today. And um, just in way of housekeeping, uh, during Gail's lecture, if there's brief questions, clarification type questions, you can send them through the Q&A um, box or the chat and we'll try and answer those or Gail will. Um, but if you have bigger questions, also send them through there, but we're gonna uh, wait until the end on those. Um, and I, I've asked Rick Rawson, um, Member, many of you know Rick on the faculty of the BCBH to do an introduction because Rick with colleagues, Scott Mac Mackey, Sanchez Maruti, and Daniel Wolfson have been working um, to bring uh, ED initiated buke to Vermont. And so Rick is really in the weeds on that. And Rick, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you for uh, introduction of Gail. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, it's an honor to uh, introduce Dr. D'Onofrio. Uh, it's kind of an inauspicious date uh, since I saw the recent um, overdose death rate has just been announced by CDC and it went above 100,000 for the first time in the history of the United States. And in fact, the state that showed the largest increase was the state of Vermont. Um, so we have a serious public health issue and Dr. D'Onofrio has been one of the real leaders in our efforts to uh, address this. She is the Albert E. Kent Professor of Emergency Medicine, Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Yale University uh, and is Physician in Chief of Emergency Services at Yale New Haven Hospital. She's boarded in emergency and addiction medicine. Uh, her CV is long and she do, has done all kinds of uh, research and, and a lot of work with mentoring younger faculty. She's uh, the PI of the New England NIDA Clinical Trials Network node, and she's a PI of a NIDA K-12 uh, training grant at Yale. Um, she's gotten lots of awards from a lot of different uh, groups. Um, but I wanna just mention, as Steve mentioned, uh, in her array of work, uh, her study published in 2017 was a real groundbreaker um, where she reported on the use of buprenorphine in emergency departments. Uh, that, su that study and her subsequent publications in that area have really made this now a routine practice in much of the United States. Um, I know I'm involved also in California, where they have a very large program imp implementing buprenorphine, and it was all based on her work. That was the, the, the seminal study, and I'm, I've been a major fan of her work um, for her career. Her talk today is um, going to be Emergency Department Initiated Buprenorphine for Opioid Use Disorder. Dr. D'Onofrio. Hey, thank you. And thank you for that um, nice entrance. So I have a lot to talk about, and um, but mostly I want to uh, make sure that I make you as passionate to start this process in anywhere that you can. Um, I have no real disclosure except that I have funding sources from a few agencies, um, but I'm going to start out by just saying what we know, and you've heard about that this and the extent of the problem. These are the recent um, national survey on drug use that, and they changed the way they reported. So it's much different than before, but 40 million Americans greater than 12 years of age have a substance use disorder. 2.7 million of those have an opiate use disorder and almost 10 million report non-medical use of pain relievers in the past year. And I think what you just heard, Dr. Rawson was um, what I heard this morning, this just came out. So, um, 
unfortunately, the death rate has increased. And this was from April to April of this past year, so 12 months prior to this past April, that um, all overdose deaths went up to 103,000. 306, which is almost 30% more than the year before, which was 30% more than the year before that, et cetera. And this was driven not just by synthetic opioids, which opioids were about 64% of the deaths in opioids, which we know is usually around two thirds. That number didn't come out, but it's about two thirds of what that 103 is. And of those, um, I do know that 66% uh, 66,000 of those were synthetic opioids, but this is driven not only by that, but also by the pandemic um, and these dual um, epidemics and pandemics colliding about each other. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I think it's also important to understand the economic burden. This is by Sean Murphy, um, who's from the Center for Health Economics of Treatment and Interventions for Substance Use Disorder um, at Columbia. So he had just uh, presented this, that um, we need to look for cost-effective treatments that is critical, um, not only just for individuals, but the public and, um, and our economic health. And that he, he talked about in, in this article in 2018, that there were $787 billion, which is now in today's dollars more than 800 billion. And these were in, excess healthcare expenditures, lost productivity, the justice system, and premature mortality. But the mean present value of inverting an OUD across all ages. So if you get somebody into treatment right away, you prevention across all ages is 2.2 million, and that's for each individual. So it's an amazing number. Um, I do always like to say that these are faces behind this, so I'm not just giving a talk, but that um, these are individuals who lose their lives, now 275 people in a single day for overdose, and that these individuals are our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, our friends, our children, um, and that there really are real people behind this. Um, we also know that treatment works, and I'm not here to talk about whether opiate agonists work or not, because that's been shown long before I entered the scene. Um, there are lots of uh, Cochrane Library um, systemic reviews, systematic reviews can tell you that um, methadone and buprenorphine, which are agonists, are very effective in retaining people in treatment, and that um, the evidence does not show that one has to have psychosocial support to change that retention and treatment. Um, it is the medication. We all obviously think that these things could be great. And I think that even more so now with uh, all the other determinants of health that have become so um, instrumental in, in whether people have success like homelessness, et cetera, are really important. And I'm not saying they aren't, but one can't wait on those things to have them in place and not start medication. So we know these issues with opiate agonists. Um, we don't know so much about um, using um, naltrexone and agonist um, and where we are with that quite truthfully. The, the studies are just really not there yet, but we do know that opiate agonists do work um, to reduce illicit use, less viral shedding of hepatitis, HIV complications, less deaths, less risky behaviors, they reduce legal consequences, and therefore the individual has more time to engage in sustainable relationships, find employment, and deal with all their other medical problems that they have. So this is a given. I'm just saying, let's make a low barrier effort to try to engage people. This was the um, consensus study report, and this was done by the by NIDA, SAMHSA, as well as the National um, Academy of Science. Um, and we do know that medications are effective. We do know they help with long range um, retention. We also know that a lack of availability, as I just said, um, of behavioral interventions doesn't justify withholding it. And most people who could benefit it, unfortunately, don't benefit it. And so we really need to confront these barriers. I hate the word barriers. I try to always think about solutions. I write about barriers, but I'm so sick of it, honestly, because we don't talk about barriers when we talk about people who need um, care for their hyperglycemia or their hypertension and their um, whatever it is. We talk about what is the science and how do we get it. And for some reason, we we constantly think we have to do more work around this. 
um, even though I will tell you that really the work we need to do is about stigma. We know that the ED offers 24-7, 365 option because that's where we're open. We know that's where the patients are. Also, that's why we focus on it, that most of these individuals do not have primary care, that primary care is in total disarray in the US, and I don't see it getting any better anytime soon. Um, and we know that um, this is costing a lot and this is very hurtful to everyone. So we're working very hard to try to make this uh, a place where people can come and at any time and get help. We see them obviously with overdose, we see them seeking treatment, and we also can identify them during the course of the visit. I like to avoid the word screening and I try to do that because that evokes all kinds of issues. In the emergency department, we probably have more than 100 issues that people would like us to screen for. Um, and it always seems to go to the nurses. And I don't think this is a nursing issue. I think it's an entire ED staff issue. And I always say, why don't we just look for the people we can find quickly and help them? And then we can delve into more complicated, nuanced areas. So um, people spend so much time trying to figure out screening, they forget to intervene on the people right in front of them. So I really wanna focus on those people who we can find easily and who are asking for our help and to move forward. This is an article that came out in GMS Psychiatry and um, earlier this year, and it's really important. It's a cross-sectional study on it used the CDC and the National Syndromic Surveillance Program, which examines national changes in ED visits between December 30th and October 10th of 2020. It captures about 70% of all US ED visits from 3,500 EDs in 48 states and the District of Columbia. And what you've seen here is that during this pandemic that everything is happening. There are just more issues with um, mental health, there are more issues with interpersonal violence in, in drugs and opiate overdoses and really everybody coming in that this has been an overwhelming uh, problem with many public health issues and we need to uh, work on that. And on the right hand side, it showed that even though visits had decreased at that particular time, that the overdose and the opiate um, related visits had markedly increased. And we're seeing this across the board and I'll show it to you in many different ways. While visits now have not decreased, we are in the middle of an unprecedented boarding in emergency departments. And many of that caused by people who didn't visit the healthcare system during the worst parts of COVID, but delayed diagnoses, delayed surgeries, as well as um, just all the other um, issues that have come up with isolation and fatalism and whatever else you want to call it, our EDs are overwhelmed. Half of our ED is with mental health and the others are um, people waiting to get admitted. This is um, some data that came out of our work um, with Ted Melnick and myself on a NIDA grant that looked at six different health centers um, and we were able to, throughout the pandemic and what we were looking for around opiate deaths and opiate non-fatal opiate visits um, for overdose. Um, and again, it just shows you in these top diagrams here, what you see is that ED visits really fell during this period of time from 2020, but we also know that the number of COVID deaths markedly rise. Or, um, and then in this other graph over here, what you also see is the number of, again, with opiate um, ED admissions, were um, higher. So even though the ED deaths went down, the amount of people that we saw were extremely severe and they um, actually escalated along with um, COVID, the COVID burden. And then in these six health systems here, we particularly looked at ED overdose visits. So obviously these were non-fatal because they got to the ED. And in this case is that gray area is really what you wanna focus on is all the excess um, amounts of overdose um, visits that we saw compared to previous um, times and what we would have predicted would have been the lower and what we got were the higher. So we know this is it. We don't need any more data about it. It's there. We also know what happens when we have inaction and 
there are very few things in emergency medicine that have the highest mortality than um, an overdose, a non-fatal overdose. And I am indebted to Mark La Rochelle, who was able to publish this from Massachusetts, which is far better than we are in the state of Connecticut and able to uh, combine and link databases. Um, what he did was he looked at everyone who came into any ED with a non-fatal overdose and followed them out um, for 12 months. And this was a huge amount of people, as you can see here, it was, it was more than 17,000. And what he found that is if people um, left to themselves without um, anything else, all cause mortality was 5%. Um, and that's high. That's almost as high as an ST elevation MI. So there is nothing else that we see in the ED that is has greater mortality than a non-fatal overdose. Yet at this point, only 30% of people received um, any medications for opiate use disorder. And if you received buprenorphine or a methadone maintenance an agonist, you could reduce that mortality by 50%. If you now Trexone did not show a reduction in mortality in this particular study. So we know what will happen if we don't intervene. And so it behooves all of us to really act um, and do something about it. We also know this is the study that came out in JAMA that if we did it, this was an efficacy study. So things were all lined up perfectly. I understand that. I didn't realize that buprenorphine would be as effective as in retention at 30 days. Um, in fact, I really thought this, the middle group, which was what we normally did have done is um, we have health promotion advocates and faculty and residents who are trained in the brief interventions that we do them. We try to motivate people to get help. We then um, did facilitated referrals to um, agencies in our community. And we're fortunate to have several of those. Um, I thought this would be the best thing. Um, and it did come out decently that 45% of people did show there. But in that group where we also did the brief intervention and started them on view and gave them a referral to a primary care setting, mm -hmm. that almost 80% were in treatment at 30 days. A referral site looks good here, but it's more than actually people did with referral because we did not do an inter a brief intervention, but we did tell them based on their um, what they wanted to do, and based on their insurance status, we gave them locations of where they could go. We also found that there was a decrease in uh, seven-day illicit opiate use with those who are using buprenorphine. Dr. Bush, in our um, in our school of public health, who was a health economist, then looked at the cost effectiveness of this intervention and looked really looked at these cost effective acceptability curves. And basically what she found was that a willingness to pay for 1% point increase in 30 days post here, willingness, any willingness to pay buprenorphine was by far um, more cost effective. And in every one day free of opiate free days, buprenorphine would be uh, much more cost effective. So we were able to show that. Um, there are other things, just so you know, that SAMHSA has, has a tip out. This needs to be updated. We fought desperately over not using the word MAT, and they changed it at the last minute in the last administration. So we're hoping to go back and change this. Also, the induction um, protocols were not really what we were doing. But the one thing it does do is show several different EDs, and some of them are, are really um, community EDs and how great they were and able to implement um, ED BUP. So it's, it does have a lot of things in it that maybe have helped you. We know we can identify patients, provide the treatments. We also need to provide harm reduction strategies and that's an integral part of what we do um, in terms of overdose education. We actually here at Yale give out Narcan to patients. We do not write scripts, we actually hand it to them we tell them to keep it on them, whether it's for them or anyone around them at all times. And we directly link people to ongoing care and as many preventive services as we can. So because we did this research, we really showed that we should really do something about it. It wasn't all about just writing about it. It was like doing about it. So what did we learn? We wanted to know what we learned and how we could move this along. So we started with um, the Clinical Trial Network 69, which was a really um, an implementation strategy, and it was a hybrid three, which meant that we um, emphasized effectiveness over implement, I mean, I'm sorry, implementation over effectiveness. 
And we used a, a multi-site stepped wedge design to look at both of these effects. Um, and we used these four sites. These were um, very academic sites from Mount Sinai, John Hopkins, University of Cincinnati, and Harborview in Seattle. And we did a real different kinds of components of implementation facilitation, which has been described here in this article. And we looked for, um, we were the external facilitators, but we found local champions. We did a lot of um, qualitative interviews to come up with a formative evaluation. We got as many people and stakeholder engagements as we could, both in the hospital as well as in the community. We tailored the um, programs help them tailor their programs so that they would have site-specific needs. We provided them with some um, academic detailing. We also really encouraged uh, feedback and performance in monitoring that. And that's probably one of the most important things I can tell you. The ED only sees bad things, people that come back, they never see the good things that happen. So it was really important that we um, get back to the team when someone was did engage in treatment. Um, we did these learning collaboratives. We tried to get people to problem solve and we put out pens and other um, little pins for you know, reducing stigma, et cetera, and did as much as we could in each of these environments. Um, besides that study, and I'll tell you about what we found, but before I do that, we did a similar study, Dr. McCormick and Hawk, um, in areas that were in rural and urban settings with high need and limited resources. And those were, you know, in Catholic Medical Center in Manchester, New Hampshire, Valley Regional Hospital, and in Bellevue. And what they did was try to find people that were, um, that were specifically were able to, um, to engage in buprenorphine, meaning that they wanted to, that they weren't on methadone, et cetera, and that they would be great candidates. And among those, um, people, which were only 40 that they collected, they found great results that 50% engaged um, in treatment and decreased their opiate use. And the more exciting also thing was that they were able to get these individuals who were at, when they were at these regional, really rural access hospital, they were able to find people, um, staff, nurses and doctors who were quite willing to do this. Um, and they had about 50 unique ED providers, um, whether they were APPs or, or MDs, um, who were willing to learn about BUP and prescribe BUP. So what we learned from all of these different studies were that there were these issues regarding difficulties in implementation, X waivers, blah, 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 as you can see here. Um, but these, this is probably true the first few of anything, people obviously have to understand about a medication that's out there and understand where we send people to. It's not particular to here. The one thing that was particular is the stigma towards patients with the OUD was really overwhelming and that's really difficult to deal with. Um, I have my ideas and I'll tell you those later, but the solutions are not just training. I can give you a spoiler alert from 69 that will come out in the next, hopefully in the next six months. Um, but uh, the, it's not just my coming and talk to you. My coming and talk to you does nothing. What really works is providing the materials, getting those champions, getting the leadership to say, you're going to do this because this is the right thing to do. All of my faculty are required to have X waivers, even when it took eight hours of training. Um, and it is a requirement. It's a CQI process um, that everyone um, asks a patient whether they want to engage in treatment. If they don't, they're given certain information until they come back. If they are, then we start initiating treatment immediately. And we really, really try through a brief intervention to get them to want to start treatment. And we give them feedback. Um, and more importantly, what came out just recently was the American College of Emergency Physician consensus recommendation. And that recommendation um, told us that you, you really need to do this. This is an expectation. This is what we expect as an emergency physician and nothing is better than when that comes out as a national statement. Um, this is an article that I just found and it just came out very recently, which I think would be um, interesting for you all is it came out in the Journal of Rural Health and it also looked at barriers and facilitators associated with this establishing um, ED initiated buprenorphine. And um, there are the, in, 
the investigators, what they found were four themes. These were positive or negative themes, if one would talk about it. And the very first one was compelled to act. And I, I couldn't help but put that um, exact quote in here, which was, I was on a shift in the evening. I received a patient from the rescue site who had overdosed and was in cardiac arrest. He went to the ICU and then ended up dying the next day. It turns out that his wife died at the scene in the same episode and they had three children. I was devastated. I could no longer just say, oh, it's someone else's problem. That case put it as my problem. So I'm hoping that we can put this as everyone's problem long before they have to go through um, this type of a situation that, again, we wouldn't think about this for someone dying with hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, a stroke from hypertension. We would never even think that we need, we would be compelled to act to begin with. So why, why that's necessary is truly beyond my capacity. Um, Hospital leadership and peer mentorship could be facilitators or barriers. If they were great, they could be great. If not, and in the last couple of days, we did have um, a wonderful workshop that was put together by NIDA CTN around ED works. We, we were able to hear from a lot of uh, several people who are also had learned experiences, who were peers, who also said, you have to be careful with peers because they were very upset by other peers that we're not encouraging medication and we're just doing what they did in the past. And so what I would tell you about peers is that there has to be um, fidelity to their interventions. Somebody has to be responsible to them. I, I run a fairly large program of health promotion advocates. They could or could not have been had lived experience. Um, it doesn't matter. What matters is that they can list, they come from the community and they can talk to patients from our community. And um, we have fidelity, we meet, I meet with a psychologist and myself a couple of times a month. We talk about cases, they can always call us. Um, they, there's no rogue going on here. There's, we are encouraging medication. Um, then again, the leadership, I, it's just like, why do I even need to go over all this with everybody? Like, this is just the care. So if you don't do this, it should be in your m and your morbidity and mortality conferences. Um, the same way as if you missed an MI or you missed an appendix or something. Um, again, stigma is a huge deal um, and finding outreach programs were difficult to, and follow up. And again, I think that the best way I'll talk to you about that is bringing in people, partnering with as many people from the community as you can, everybody learning about each other and having a dual um, conversation constantly about issues that may come up, just because keep always one thing in mind. The one thing in mind is the patient and the patient outcome and the individual's outcome. Nothing else should get in the way except for that individual. A lot of people are worried, oh, the people keep coming back to the ED, blah, blah, blah. Personally, I don't really care if they came back because if they came back, I, I can actually take care of patients very quickly who need um, treatment. I can have them in and out quicker than an urgent care. But um, visit, but people are worried about this. So I was indebted to Ross Sullivan from upstate New York, who actually published his, his experience from ED patients going to a bridge clinic that had decreased visits. So of these 269 patients, he looked at them six months prior visits, six months prior and six months after, and found there was a reduction of 42% in ED visits once they were referred to BUP programs. And that this is amazing that 56% of them were still adherent and attending the referral clinic at two years. So there it is. People want the evidence. People say, oh, I don't have the evidence. Even really smart people in emergency medicine. I'm at conferences all the time. Say, we don't have any of this. I go, oh, yes, we do. Here's the article. Um, and so here it is. Um, if anyone needed extra modification, this is what we talked about before. This is the consensus recommendation. And so here it is. This is what ASEP is saying. And ASEP is taking a very strong stance that this is what we should do. Also, I'm indebted to the Legal Action Center. This is a group of, um, this is a nonprofit, which is um, a group of um, lawyers and attorneys, as well as um, a emergency physician. Um, who are looking at different, different topics that um, cause inequities in healthcare. And they actually started talking and looking about what was happening with opiate use disorder. And they put out 
this wonderful document where they interviewed many of us um, in EDs and really came out and said that um, we would be liable for violations of Intalo, which means that we have to um, treat anyone who comes to our door, regardless of their ability to pay or who they are, that we would also violate the Americans with Disability Act, the Rehabilitation Act, and the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act if we fail to adopt these practices resulting in patient harm. So I think this is um, important that people know that they have a moral responsibility and an ethical responsibility and a legal responsibility to a professional responsibility to do this. So um, as um, Amaya had said in the past, many of you may know this quote, do the best you can until you know better Then, when you know better, do better. So um, people are always concerned, can I do this? Can I not do this? You know, anyone can treat withdrawal. It doesn't matter if you're a physician or a practitioner of any kind, you can treat withdrawal. Um, the FDA allows us to um, give, the DEA, sorry, to give up to three days of um, buprenorphine, but the patient has to come back. We are trying to make this go away, but this is what we have right now. Um, HHS did release this new bu practice guidelines that expanded access to treatment so that now one doesn't have to go through the eight hours of training. Um, and we are trying very hard to get rid of this, but it is an act of Congress. So only Congress can um, fix this. Um, and the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, which has been forwarded through Congress with these people from New York, Democrats and Republicans, um, and we are hoping, there is your state sponsors there uh, from New Hampshire. Um, Maggie Hassan is trying to get this act through that would abolish the acts waiver. But until that time, um, anybody can go on this website here and apply for one without having done the eight hours of training. What they just need to say is they're under the practice guidelines and they would treat less than 30 patients a month and in any ED provider, that's fine because you're not gonna have 30 people that you're constantly treating. We learned from these uh, 69 and 79 studies um, because we also did a lot of focus groups with patients, which were really heartbreaking um, to do them. I did all of them in 69. Um, they really, uh, patients really wanted these low barrier access particularly after an overdose. People say people don't want it, but 50% of the people do want it. So um, the glass is half full there. Um, they thought that the ED staff didn't understand addiction and perceive it as a disease. They thought their perceptions of pain and medical issues were minimized um, because of their history. And they felt often stigmatized when receiving care. But they did note, and this is as we were doing this over four sites and up in, in um, New Hampshire, that um, things were getting a little bit better, that one or two of them had some positive experience with clinicians. So they felt like it was, it, it was getting um, moved a little bit forward. Um, the biggest problem though is stigma. I don't have a correct answer for this. Although I think a lot can be done by role modeling. So if one can get champions and all this goes from the person who first sees a patient at triage to um, the nursing staff who do the initial triage to the first provider that they may see the APP or the, or the MD um, that they are welcoming as they would be with any other patient and talk to them about their disease and what they can do to help them um, get into treatment. Um, so I think role modeling does it. I think that calling people out cause it if someone says something to then take them aside later and say, you know, it'd be best if maybe if you use this conversation. Um, but if we have this expectation, it would be better um, to do that. Language and words do matter. This was an article that was originally published by Bonchelli, who was at that time at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. And he said, it's really our professional duty that we strive to use language that actually reflects science, promotes evidence-based treatment and demonstrates the respect for patients. Um, and this is really, really important. And it's really important that we use the correct words. When we talk about patients, it's a disorder. 
and that it's a disease and that is a drug addiction and the, the positive and negative urines, not whether it's clean or dirty and there may return to use. We know that happens um, and, and we shouldn't be surprised that that happens. What we do need to do is figure out why it happens and to escalate that care. So again, that's a person who might need more intensive outpatient treatment if possible, might need to see their provider more often, whatever it is that they need. They need escalating services, not a reduction in services, and there should never ever be um, anyone who said that someone should leave because of something um, at all, but they should just escalate the services. And there will be many treatment attempts, but we will continue to do that. I know that, um, and this is, this is what we found out where many of the barriers of the patients that are still happening right now, that um, provider doesn't have the sex waiver, so we need to get rid of that. Um, patient is in, in sufficient withdrawal, so that's important, but if you have an X waiver, that's fine. You just somehow give them the buprenorphine to do um, unobserved induction on their own, and we do that all the time, and it works fine, and you can do that. Um, we actually hand them medication. We, we do it through our hospital and give them five days of buprenorphine because we know it's really difficult for people to get that medicine. So I would suggest that you try everything you can to fill that script, give it to them right before they leave because they will have tons of difficulty. I can't tell you how many times people will call. Uh, the person doesn't have the proper identification. People who are homeless and or don't have cars generally don't have the proper identification. In order to get that identification, it costs a lot of money to just get an identification card from the government. Um, sometimes if they have insurance, um, and uh, I don't know about your Medicaid issues of whether they have pre-approval, um, there's all kinds of things that are in problems. So we can figure that out. Um, so if I have a couple questions, I do want to answer them right away. And one, I'm glad that you asked about whether there's drug diversion. I could care less about drug diversion. And there are actually some um, articles that are out there. And I'll try to find one. There was a recent article that really came out and said that it really was of little consequences about diversion, that diversion is really used to not use a drug. So when people are buying buprenorphine on the street, they're buying it so that they can feel better and not withdraw. Every time they use a medication like buprenorphine, they are not, and they're attempting to do that, they are one less time they're injecting or snorting or using um an illicit drug such as, it is all fentanyl, by the way, all of it is fentanyl. So they, they have let one less opportunity to die. So um, I'm not, um, I really don't care about it, but these articles are clearly have shown that in, this is the least diverted drug, but if it is diverted, it's being used by people for reasons um, that are important. And that's, um, that is what we want to happen. Um, and in terms of how long people are on here, people should, could possibly be on this for their life. We don't ask people with diabetes to get off their insulin. How many people do you know who have diabetes are able to um, stop their insulin? They are rare. Those are, that's another thing where medication is the primary treatment. Um, there are millions of behavioral, lots of behavioral issues, of course. People could always need to lose weight. They can have a better diet. They, they need to have eye care and foot care and, and everything else wrapped around that. However, even in the best of circumstances, people don't get to do all those things. And it's one in a million that come off of it. So we don't talk about that. We want them to stay on as long as they can. I've known people have been on even very small doses of buprenorphine for a really long time. When they tried to come off, they overdose. So there, we don't know what happens, but I can tell you that the brain does not reset easily afterwards. And all of those reasons not just the genetic reasons, but all of the environmental reasons are still there. So I would not suggest anyone comes off except for a long, long period of time and everything be perfect in everybody's life. And it's possible, but it's highly unlikely and don't have the expectations about that. There's nothing, you know, it would be, you don't come off your hypertensive meds easily um, nor anything else in the process of medicine. So how do we um, translate this and how do you start it? Well, I think we should be more explicit than my just 
chatting with you here. So this is the overall plan. You know, we need teams, of course, we need local champions. We need the leadership to say, this is, this is what we need to do. And I'm not going to go over this anymore with you. It is what we're going to do. We need by bi-directional communication with our community partners. Um, we need them to tell us when something is wrong, if a patient is, is sent somewhere. I can't tell you when I went to these four places around the country, the, the absolute miscommunication and misinformation, they both thought of each other from the community and the ED. There was one place in Baltimore that everyone was sent to because it was right next to the hospital. And they then told me, I can't believe how stupid these people are. These practitioners send me all these people. We don't take patients off the street. They had these crazy idea that people would have to sit there for a week without medication. And maybe then they would put them in their program. So we came around that. Okay, if that's your plan, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give them the meds for five days. Tell them to go sit over there just sit there with you and do whatever you want and then get them in the program. Cause once they were in the program, it was a great program and a lot of services and housing. But if they expected people to sit there for five days without medication and wait, that was totally unacceptable. Um, and I can tell you this in all of these sites, everyone told me they didn't have anyone. Within two days, I found great sites, fabulous sites, sites that they would be taken within the next day, sites that were happy to take them, happy to have um, communication. But no one had even gone outside the doors of the ED to figure out what that was. Um, anticipate things that are going to happen and find solutions before they happen. Anticipate every single thing that could happen that people would say. And my favorite way of discussing this is saying, we're going to get to yes. Now, how we get to yes may be difficult, but I want each of you to tell me what you need to get to yes. And then we'll, we'll break down each one of those things and we'll get to yes. Don't tell me all the reasons we aren't going to get to yes. Very similar to motivational interviewing. As you know, we don't ask people what they like about the drug. We ask them reasons for them not to, you know, reasons for them to want to make a change, not reasons for them to, um, use their drug. So it's very similar. We need to get to yes. Tell me how you need to get to yes. And then you do this and you do monitoring and feedback because people need to understand that all of their efforts are working when they might think they're not. Like, like when these things come out of 100,000, it's demoralizing to all of us. And even my husband in the last time it came out said to me one morning, well, whatever you're doing, it's not working. You need to work harder. So yes, that's demoralizing, but I can tell you about all these great stories, the stories of people who did really well, and that's what keeps everyone going. So we will develop protocols, tools, and resources. I'll help you, but don't make the um, perfection be the enemy of the good. All you need is one doc, one, one clinician to do it, and then let people watch them and they'll catch on and then do all this. If you wait for everything to be perfect and the protocol to be perfect and everything, everything, it, you'll never get there. So the components that you need are just, I'm going to identify these patients and just pick the ones that you see that right in front of your face. You need to assess that they have opiate use disorder. In the last shift that I work, I had five overdoses, four of which did not have an opiate use disorder. One used cocaine, for example, was at a bar, thought she was using cocaine, it was fentanyl. One also bought a pill they thought was a Percocet, because they'd had an old injury in their arm and it was acting up and occasionally he would use a Percocet. Someone offered him one because he said his arm was bothering him more. Turned out to be fentanyl. So all of these things we need to know, they have an opiate disorder. This is not you know, an unexpected use of fentanyl. Um, then we need to know what level of withdrawal they are in because that will tell us whether we initiate treatment right away or whether we do that and give them the opportunity to do that on their own, which works quite well. And we need to know if they're pregnant. And the reason is not that we're not going to treat them. We are, but they often can jump the line in many of your community resources. And often the woman doesn't know that she's pregnant. And so she has options available to her um, at that point. And she may want to choose um, something like buprenorphine more than methadone because you cannot switch once you're on it. But again, that could be up to the center that she goes to. Um, we then have an algorithm and I can share that with you at any time. It's on the bottom of the screen and California Bridge has algorithms. They're all very similar. 
things we treat, what we do learn is that we treat more with more bup, not less bup. And then we always give them a referral, a real referral. That may mean that it's like, you're going to go here. It's Monday. I'm giving you enough medication for five days. You're going to go on Wednesday. I always give them more than you anticipate. And now with COVID, I've given more than seven day um, scripts all the time. That's because they may have trouble getting into the site. The last thing you want is someone sitting there in active withdrawal and craving while they're sitting waiting for these large amounts of intake. So you want to make sure that they have enough medication. One dose in the ED is not induction. So if you gave an eight milligram dose, it's not enough for somebody withdrawing a 20, 25 cows in severe withdrawal. They need to be able to take more later in the day, depending on when you see them, and they need to be able to take some early in the morning. So you want to give them adequate doses so that they will be prepared and that they'll start to feel like they might feel a little bit better and able to follow up on their plan. And as we know that... Um, all of these higher functioning uh, capacities may be somewhat diminished. So they might not show up there on Tuesday, but they could show up on Wednesday or they could show up on Thursday. So we also tell them that we're fitting them in because all of these places don't know how many people I'm gonna send and they should be prepared to sit there for a while, that, that they will be seen that day and they will get more medication, but they need to be uh, conscious of the fact that they've been an add-on. And that's on them to understand that and on you to provide enough medication so that they're capable of staying there. This is our take home guide. We have it in both English and Spanish if you want it. If you go on our website, if you just put in Google um, Yale EDBUP, they'll come up, you can have them um, and you can use them. This is on our discharge sheets for all of our patients if we're gonna do um, a guide to using BUP on your own. We used to say home induction. We don't since so many of our, so many of our patients do not have stable housing. Here it is in Spanish. Um, we also have a referral form. Again, you can do whatever you want with this. Most of the time now in Epic, we can throw things in Epic without doing all this. If it's somebody that you have to fax, you can make up whatever form you want to fax to the, um, to the community site. It's really the only reason I put this up is to make sure you have one. You can put as little or as much as you have on it. We generally don't do things anymore like LFTs, et cetera, because once they get to the site, they're gonna have a lot of testing, HIV, um, hep C. So we don't even do that. One exciting thing um, is that as part of um, working with um, Dr. Melnick, we were able to embed, um, create a lot of things. Um, we did actually officially embed this buprenorphine pathways into EPIC. And I'm really happy to say that it looks like EPIC has, we've been working with main EPIC and all of these things will be um, incorporated into the new version. So that's pretty exciting. And you'll be able to um, do as much or as little of this clicks as you want. So if you want to look at the diagnosis, it'll tell you and it'll score for you what the DSM-5 quest questions are some adapted from the DSM-5. It will give you the cow score and you can, you can score that. It will talk to you about motivational readiness if you want to, but if you don't, I'll just tell you how much to give. And this is also in, um, in MD Calc and it actually is in the phone app right now. So anyone who um, wants to look up MD Calc, you can, it'll give you all the algorithms on your phone. This is another exciting adoption and you can do this, it's free. You can download it, it's called Bup Initiation. When you go on this, it opens up and you have, this is your first screen. In the first screen, it says, do you have an opiate disorder? How much are they withdrawing and are they ready to go? If you know that they do because they're injecting every day, if you know that um, what their withdrawal is, you know, just by looking at the patient, you go, yep, here they are and they're ready to go. You don't need to do anything else. You press the button, it'll tell you how much to give. If you don't know any of these things, you can press on opiate use disorder outcomes, the questions and score. If you don't know the cow score and you want to do that, outcomes, the scoring. Um, and so there's all kinds of things in there, but it can be done with a few clicks and you can even email it to yourself the directions and 
discharge instructions and, and you can print that wherever you are. So it used to be that people my age, for example, didn't like any of this stuff because we thought doctors really have big brains. They don't need to have any of this. I hate these applications. I hate people telling me what to do, but I'm gonna tell you that this new generation, they don't really care. You give me the algorithm and I'll do it. So I think um, a lot of people will be very prepared to go ahead and use this. Um, there's also lots of websites that are here. The NIDAP website has many of these motivational um, interviews um, here on videos and anybody can use those. They're really three to five minute videos, except for the adolescent one, which is much longer, but the others are very quick videos of what to say. You can agree to disagree, but these are the resources and we're always here. In terms of testing new interventions, um, we published this paper, which is really great uh, with Dr. Herring, and it was at his site in Oakland. We did a retrospective review of an entire year there where we looked at almost 600 encounters um, that were given um, high dose bup, which was de defined as over 12 milligrams. There were no cases of respiratory depression or sedation, and there were five cases a precipitated withdrawal, which were not at all related to the dose. So when you look at this paper, what you'll see first is that the, and these are the dosing strategies up here, that first of all, um, the patients who got the largest doses were in and out faster than the ones that got the lower doses. And I think the reason for all of that, when you'll see this, is that um, if they were pretty straightforward, they got large doses and they did well and they left pretty quickly. If they were unclear as to a lot of things, that's when they might have given them the smaller doses. And so more of those people, a little bit more of those people were um, not statistically different, but that's why you got this 9% or five that were admitted because these were people that had other issues and um, they might think differently about giving high dose. So for example, they had COPD, um, are there respiratory complications or they, um, had OSA or something else that one would worry about giving high doses. Um, and equally, they may return to the ED in any of those groups. So um, this is an option. Um, it isn't for everybody, but it is for some individuals. Works well if a person's going to lock up for the weekend because uh, a uh, high dose, we give them 24 milligrams, we'll keep them through till Monday. Also exciting in this, it wasn't like one group of doctors. It wasn't just Dr. Herring or his group. It was all the doctors. So 54 unique providers were observed throughout that year. All 21 of their APPs um, had used a high dose at least once. And 88% of their MDs had administered high dose buca one. And most of these individuals with obese disorder seeking treatment or identified do go to their fast track and they are seen often by the APPs. So high dose induction was safe and effective in this one study that was retrospective in people who really knew what they were doing and had great, um, but that you can do that. We can, we can teach you how to do that. Um, Another thing is what we're doing now with ED innovation. Um, we are now comparing um, XR Bup, which is Brayburn's um, seven day injectable with sublingual in approximately 2000 patients with untreated OUD and seeing if either of these um, formulations will um, have some effect on whether they get to treat within seven days. This, this study started pre-COVID. Um, and it's had lots of issues with it. And um, more likely during COVID, people didn't get to treatment no matter where they were for about 10 days. Um, we've now enrolled more than 750 patients. Um, and we're doing another study where we have enrolled, um, which is called the ancillary, where we enroll patients who aren't withdrawing at all. And uh, we are um, using the injectable and that has gone very well actually. But uh, this is moving along and we certainly have done very well with our XR view, but I would like to tell you that in the entire subset here, only eight, I said, only eight people had precipitated withdrawal. So there's a lot of, again, miscommunication that um, you can't use buprenorphine in people with fentanyl or you have all these issues. Um, there, there are a couple of issues and we'll talk to you about those, but we are now using bup. Um, 
We are using the injectable in people as low as four right now with uh, cow scores as low as four. If people are not in enough withdrawal in the sublingual, we give them um, um, the ability to take it on their own at um, on their own, as we said, and then um, continue with their induction at home. So with that, we're doing really quite well and have been, had very few incidences of withdrawal. CAM 2038 may be approved um, by the end of this calendar year, which is why I'm telling you a little bit about it. We hope to have a paper out soon, but it is an injectable sort of like um, Lovenox, so the nurses know how to give it. It can be given anywhere in the abdomen, in the um, upper gluteal area, which is my preferred area, or in the thigh. Um, it's very, very tiny. Um, and uh, the only other things to know, it's a little gel capsule in there that the person who gives the injection doesn't rub it afterwards. Um, that's really it. And if you look at the pharmacokinetics of it, it gradually increases. It gets to two um, nanograms per milliliter right around four hours and then gradually goes up. Um, this is why in many circumstances, you can give this with a patient with low levels of withdrawal. We've even testing it in very low levels and we've been okay. But for now in this study, we're telling people four and over as opposed to the sublingual, which has this very high spike in concentration early on and then, um, you know, is pretty well gone at 24 hours. Um, so it is um, it, it is a possibility um, to be a great thing in our armamentarium um, when it is FDA approved. The upslope of this is different than um, Sublicate, for example, or if, if this, per, this pharmaceutical company, I hate to like say the name all the time because it doesn't matter to me which one you give. Um, but the other company doesn't have a seven day one for the ET. When you uh, when you give the seven the 30 day injections, they have a much higher steep of rise of um, medication. And that does worry about me using that quickly in an ED because if they're not withdrawing enough, they might um, go into precipitated withdrawal. But the seven day um, injectable is perfect. Uh, overall, this is just to let you know, we are redoing this now for 700 patients that were withdrawn, that the only important thing to note is everybody uses everything. So about 83% of people are using opiate with another drug. And we did find, if we looked at West and East sites, that the West is using a lot more um, of methamphetamine, as you can see here. Um, and the East is using a lot more cocaine. Um, and so that is all I can say about that, but everybody's using everything. We're mostly seeing where, where I am is cocaine and um, marijuana uh, along with um, fentanyl and everybody who doesn't think they're taking fentanyl are all taking fentanyl. So um, we're doing some active surveillance so we can see where these areas are. Again, I think if you treat the opiate withdrawal and the opiate addiction, people are much easier to think about whatever else you want to do to treat the other things, whether that's in your site, um, contingency management or, or CPD, I, I don't know, but it, people are much more um, willing to um, enter into other groups or whatever if you can treat their opiate withdrawal. So what we learned is the extent of the problem, treatment does work, the ED is a great option, um, the consequences of an action, the evidence, and we also learn how to break down some of these barriers, increase success, and we're investigating other implementation strategies, doses, formulations, and surveillance techniques. But at the end of the day, this is an editorial I wrote with a lawyer from the Legal Action um, Council, which was, med we are medically, legal, and morally, we cannot ignore addiction treatment, and that offering buprenorphine is not a choice. And we won't stop until every ED has this. This is the California Bridge um, sign that's in front of all their EDs. If you need help, we're here to help you. So um, you will get all these websites so that you will have them. And you can also go on California Bridge. They have a lot of information there as well. And um, I've got this, which we can do, but if you need it later, but I'm gonna stop there. Um, and I'm sharing if you have any questions. I know we've answered some of them. Let me know. Well, it looks like you have one question in the Q&A. Uh, do you offer any advice on um, 
uh, dri about driving after leaving the ED? Uh, using, uh, after using buprenorphine? Yes. Um, no, we don't offer advice um, about driving more than we do on any, any other any other substance that people, if they're intoxicated on any other substance, we, you know, taking buprenorphine for people who have OED is, um, is only going to help them as opposed to not helping them. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, I think always, I think probably is in one of our long discharge instructions, not using heavy equipment or doing blah, 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 but it's not something that we, um, have made a huge deal on it. I think in your case of a, in our case, many of these people don't have a car and many of them, um, it's nice if someone could pick them up, but many of them don't have a car and have unstable housing and they're going to be taking public transportation. But I think as a general um, rule, would I say it any different than anywhere else? No, um, I'm treating their withdrawal and they should be much better off than when they came in. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I don't, let's see if there's any more. I don't see any... Um... I don't see any additional questions you gave, or well, you answered some of the questions as you went right. along and you did a very comprehensive um, presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, the slides have been posted already. Um, so uh, yeah, I think um, at this point we're probably out of time and I know you have a, a busy schedule, Gail. So any final, anything, questions, um, chats? Gail, any final remarks? I, I just want to tell you, if you need more information, I'm always willing to give it to you. We have a lot of resources prepared. Um, I think, though, this these talks don't do that much. I'm always happy to give them. But what really needs to be done is people write boots on the ground, get in there, say, we're going to do this. This is how we're going to do it, and just go forward. And and really don't try to make perfection the enemy of the good. Just get one person who's willing to do it and get someone to say as the leader of the ED or quality improvement that we're gonna work on this and we're gonna make it a quality improvement program because there is no, nothing else that's gonna have such a high rate of mortality. And we're, we have expectations of what happens to our patients. And when they don't do this, then some, they should be called out and say, why didn't you? You should have dot phrases you know, made up, like I, this person has obese disorder, I've offered them treatment today, they don't want to take it, but I've given them all the information and they know they can come back, period, that's it. Wonderful, yeah, thanks so much, Gail. It's really been tremendous. And I, I did see Daniel Wolfson in the participant, he's leading uh, along with Rick Ross and others, the charge here at the UVM Med Center where they are um, following your lead and doing Buke inductions there. So, okay. Wonderful. All right. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye now. Bye bye.